My name is Thessaline Samji, and it is my pleasure to be your MC this evening for this lecture titled Islamic Geometric Designs by Eric Rowe. Eric is actually Dutch, and his name is French. So when I say Rowe, you say it in French, okay? <laughs> it's a very difficult name to pronounce. He knows that, and I apologize for butchering it. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the, church, is the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the shared traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil First Nations. Before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. First, may I kindly request that you take a moment to ensure that your phones are on silent. Please note that the restrooms in the social hall are located adjacent to the alcove at the front of the social hall, the alcoves at the social, in the front of the social hall, and the men's is located to my left, and the women's is on the right. I would now like to welcome Shala Kanji, co-chairperson of the Aga Khan Museum team for British Columbia, who will provide us with some opening remarks. time of life when I need these now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, patrons of the Aga Khan Museum, good evening and welcome to the Ismaili Center Burnaby. On behalf of the Aga Khan Museum and in partnership with the Ismaili Center Burnaby and Simon Fraser's University's Center for the Comparative Muslim Studies, it is my pleasure, my great pleasure, to welcome you tonight to, to tonight's lecture on Islamic geometric designs presented by Eric, dare I say your last name, Eric Rowe. <laughs> this center is one of six such centers worldwide and the first in Canada. The second, of course, is the Ismaili Center Toronto, which occupies the same site as the Aga Khan Park and the Aga Khan Museum. While forged in a common spirit, each center is unique. Their architecture is rooted in the rich tapestries of Muslim heritage and tradition, and their design is intended to reflect a mood of humility, forward outlook, and dialogue. It's so fitting that we're gathered here in the Ismaili Center Burnaby for a lecture on Islamic geometry. The design brief for this center called for a synthesis of Islamic architecture and contemporary building design. A synthesis of architectural principles steeped in the tradition of the faith, while at the same time coexisting with the requirement of modern day society. In a speech given to the Asia Society in 1979, His Highness speaks about the use of geometry. And he says, in Islamic design, the basic forms are, are, are balanced and ruled by geometry. There's a sense of stability, tranquility, and equilibrium. And with serenity goes modesty. There's a lack of domination and pride, end quote. In a world where increased interaction between peoples and cultures has often led to misunderstanding and fragmentation, the arts provide a powerful window of connection into the history and tradition of the other. The artistic endeavor is perhaps one of the most beautiful aspects of our humanity, reflective of both our unity and our diversity. It draws on the common creative spirit that lies beneath our differences, but also manifests itself in a multitude of physical expressions across time and space. We live in a time where the need for communication and understanding between Muslim and non-Muslim societies is more important than ever before. And the Aga Khan Museum plays a vital role in bridging this divide. Our mandate to educate and to inspire is not just limited to the walls of the Physical Museum in Toronto, but stretches out across Canada all the way to BC and also across the world. 
Our ability to do this, of course, rests upon the constant support and tireless efforts of our global patrons and volunteers. In closing, I would like to take this moment to thank and acknowledge the support of our donors and members of our patron circle, particularly to those here in British Columbia, many of whom are here with us this evening. It's largely due to your support and dedication that the Aga Khan Museum is able to carry out its mandate and bring events like this to life. This event, of course, would not have been possible without the support, the great support, of the Iswani Council for British Columbia, as well as our wonderful partners at Simon Fraser University. And, of course, without Eric. Thank you, Eric, for being with us today. And we really look forward to an exciting and inspiring evening, as well as more in the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Shala. I just want to say how amazing it is uh, that there is just so much diversity in this crowd tonight. And there are a lot of Eric fans out there, and here that um, there's a couple that came from Virginia as well. So that's pretty amazing. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Eric Rowe. Eric, Eric Rowe is an author, educator, designer who specializes in Islamic geometric design. He has a master's degree in the history of Islamic art and architecture from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Eric's first book, Islamic Geometric Patterns, has taught thousands of readers around the world how to draw in the same way traditional craftsmen have done for centuries. It has been published in several languages, including Farsi and Turkish. He has also been active in Islamic geometric design for over 25 years and is passionate about the creative and educational opportunities that the artistic tradition offers. Eric has given workshops and lectures around the world and is involved as a consultant in various educational projects across the Middle East. He runs a design and education consultancy business in the UK and is the founder of the School of Islamic Geometric Design, which offers online educational resources and courses. He has a global online network of over 16,000 followers and through his online presence has established himself as a leading expert in this field who seeks to connect the traditional with the contemporary. Please join me in welcoming Eric Rowe. for those uh, gracious introductions. Um, well, before I start, I also have people to thank, of course, uh, the Higher Khan Museum being one of them, the Ismaili Council of British Columbia being another, Simon Fraser University. Um, I'm just very pleased to, to be here. We've been discussing ways to get to go back to Vancouver uh, for a while, and you know, this evening is the first event of, uh, of three days of workshops and, and lectures. What I want to do this evening is to, well, like the title says, to give you a presentation on Islamic geometric design, but in the context of Islamic geometric design as a visual language. And like any language, you can learn to read it and you can learn to write it. And how that works, I will try and show. Um, I'll also tell you a little bit about myself, if I may. After my presentation, there'll be Q&A. And then after the Q&A, there will be book signing. Um, no more book selling, I'm told, because it's, <laughs> they're sold already. Um, yes, yeah, so save your questions until the, uh, until the end of the I mean, I've got, uh, I've got an, uh, an associate there who's in charge of uh, pressing the forward button. <laughs> so, what has always appealed to me about Islamic geometric design that you can look at, for example, a building like this in Cairo, and these patterns, even though in this case they're from the 15th century, can also be presented as if they belong in the 21st century, and that's, that's always been very interesting to me. Similarly, with this building, this is the um, tomb of Itimad in, um, in India. It's, of course, it, it, it's 
tempting to focus on, on one pattern, but of course the, the composition, the masterpiece is, is the building, and that's always the case, and you know, that's true for this Jamal Khan as well. You can look at small details and appreciate them, but in the context of Islamic geometric design, it's important to realize that you're looking at part of a bigger composition in, in the same way that you wouldn't look at a painting by Rembrandt and say, this is fantastic because of the way this little orange has been painted. You know, you, you take everything into consideration, and, and the same is true for Islamic geometric design and art and architecture in a bigger, in a bigger sense. We'll talk a little bit about domes as well, but there's also, there's the beauty of Islamic geometric design, but there's also the skill, of course, to, to, and the ingenuity to admire, and nowhere more so, in my opinion, than on domes like this one. Not just this one, you have beautiful domes with geometric patterns in Cairo as well. This one's in Iran. And if you think about this, you think, well, to do this on the computer would be very difficult. To do this 400 years ago with a pencil and a ruler and a compass is, you know, it is very difficult, but they, but they manage it, of course. This is another good example. This is in Turkey. This is also a great pattern. I think this is, if somebody told me that this is not from the 13th century, but from the 21st century, I would believe it. You know, this is a very old building, but these patterns are so strong and bold that they really lend themselves very well for presenting them in a new way in the 21st century. And that's always been interesting for me to find the intersection between traditional and contemporary. Um, you know, and this building also does that very well. So that's always an interesting and exciting intersection to, uh, to find. Yeah, so briefly about me. So this is where I started Islamic Geometric Design. There, <laughs> to be precise, that was my student accommodation in Amsterdam. And I was studying Middle Eastern politics. And I was in my third year, and at some point I thought, ah, it's interesting, but it's not that interesting. You know, and I want to find something that will be a big challenge, something that will keep my brain and my heart occupied forever, ideally. Um, and I didn't know what that was, but I knew it wasn't Middle Eastern politics. So I dropped out and started working in a bookshop, and soon thereafter I found this book, which some of you might have. Let's do a raise of hands. Who's got this book? Okay. So this is a very good book to have. It's free online as well, but it's also nice to have a, a physical copy. This is a book that I bought, and it was it's available as a cheap Dover edition, but the original edition was written in the 19th century by a gentleman called Jules Bourgoin. Uh, he was a French diplomat, and he was stationed in Alexandria in, uh, in Egypt. And on his days off, he would go to Cairo, and he would document geometrical patterns. And the book has 200 pages of just that, just patterns. And I found it fascinating. I thought, well, this is something that is art, it's science, it's creativity, it's under-researched. You know, there's all sorts of interesting things that I could try and do. But what the book, the book just shows you the results. It doesn't show you the process. So for, for 10 years, I use this book to deconstruct in order to reconstruct with a, with a compass for circles and a ruler for lines. And um, that's how I taught myself, really. And that's also the way I taught myself is also the way I now teach in my books and in my workshops. Uh, and it's based on the premise that the craftsmen who traditionally made these patterns were not mathematicians. These were people who knew how to make things with their hands. And the tools that they had were a compass for circles and a rule for lines. And they were able to make, I would argue, all these compositions, all these patterns, just with those two tools. And if they could do it, in theory, we could do it as well. So that's how I approach Islamic geometric design. These patterns can be drawn with circles and lines. We just need to know which circles and lines and in which order. So this is an example of one of those compositions that I did when I was living in Amsterdam. And when I look at it now, I can see why I abandoned this one, because shapes are supposed to be symmetrical for a start. So when I look at this, I can see, let's have a look. There's a couple of bad ones here. So this, you know, that's not symmetrical. 
this ship is supposed to be the same as that, this ship is really tiny. So at some point I thought, well, I can't, I can't salvage this, I'm just going to start, start a new one, basically. But when you draw by hand, it's a really good way to learn, because you get punished for your mistakes. And if you do it on the computer, you don't really get that, because on the computer you can say, okay, this angle needs to be 36 degrees, this needs to be 72, and it's always fast. But if you do it by hand, it's a very different experience. And little mistakes in the, close to the center become big mistakes the further away you go from the center. So I would recommend to anyone who wants to develop their skill in drawing patterns to draw by hand, certainly at the beginning. So these are two that did make it to the finish line. So in the, when I started initially, I saw I thought the biggest challenge and the biggest creative rewards could be found in trying to make new patterns. But I soon found that it's, I found it very difficult to make anything that's better than what's already been done. I would create things that were invariably worse and you know not, not as uh, not as balanced and beautiful as the, as the traditional patterns. So there's a lot of so I discovered that there's a lot of creative opportunity in embellishing and in presenting traditional patterns in a new way, and that's that's still what I do. So traditionally, in geometric design, you will see that there's a composition will have the juxtaposition of curved lines and straight lines. The straight lines being the geometric pattern, the curved lines being leaf elements sometimes a band of calligraphy. And this balance between curved and straight is an essential part of Islamic art and also in architecture. So, of course, I've, tried, I've done something different here. I've done it in a way that I want to do, but still it's traditional in the sense that you try and find a balance between rectilinear and curvilinear. I'm also interested in, in this. Do people know? This is... This is um, Mukarnas. Mukarnas is unique to Islamic architecture and is basically three-dimensional Islamic geometric design. And the way you draw it is similar to, or almost identical to two-dimensional geometric design, but then you have to pull it apart to make it a, a three-dimensional object. So for example, briefly, I don't delve into it too much, if you look at that piece there, Oh yeah, you're having a point that's right. <laughs> so if you look at this for example, this is half an eight-pointed star. But that is that layer there, that is this thing here. And then you've got another layer there that sits outside that. So you draw it as if it's a two-dimensional star pattern, but then you chop it up into tiers and you pull it apart basically, and then you connect it with vertical section. So there's a little YouTube tutorial that I've made that shows you how to make this this thing. So this is the the Persian version, if you will. Uh, you also have a Moroccan style Mukarnas where instead of creating horizontal layers, you create vertical sections, triangular sections that you put together like that. And visually you get the same effect, but you construct them in a very different way. So this is also something that's really waiting to be dragged into the 21st century. I would argue. It's unique to Islamic architecture. It's, you can make it very complex, you can make it very simple, but it's, you know, it's, it lends itself to a new interpretation, I would argue. So, here we see some uh, Mukarnas in action. This was in, in Islam. Here also. So this is much more complex than the one that I've made, of course. But it's the same. It's the same principle, except that you use more variables, basically. <coughs> this is something I made a few years ago uh, for a museum in, in the UK, in Bradford. They invited me to make something for their permanent collection, and they had budget, so I'm grateful to spend that on a, on a neon star. So for me, that's exciting, because it's, it's a very traditional pattern. This particular pattern, you will find that in, across the Islamic world. But then to make it big in neon, then presents it, makes it look like something that also belongs in this century. That was the idea. This is a close-up of something that's happening now. Here we go. Yes, uh, 
Here's the Tyler, a Torre, put in the final touches to it. This is a super big, it's a technical term I think, composition in, uh, in Dewsbury, in the UK, close to where I live. And it's a new um, educational center in one of those typical northern English towns that if it's rainy it's, and gray, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not it's not always a very sunny environment, so there was an opportunity to make something really big on the exterior. So I chose a composition from a madrasa in Meknes and deconstructed it and drew it. Uh, so the composition is the same, but then the colors that I've chosen are, are different. Um, uh, it's finished now, but it's still covered in, in scaffolding, so I've only been able to see it from a meter distance. And in January will be the big reveal where we get to see the thing in its entirety. So, uh, yeah, God willing, it'll, uh, it'll work. Yeah, so this is what it looks like. So what I've done, well, the reason I'm showing this picture mainly is that the, in Islamic art and in architecture, the role of color is not just to make something pretty. It's also to make something legible. And if you imagine that this composition was just in black and white, it would be too much. You know, you, you, what could you do with that? You would look at it and think, okay, fine. And that would be it. Color serves to break a complex composition down into visually digestible elements. And also it gives you something to look at depending on your proximity. So in this case, you can see, you can see this from 50 meters away. Of course, if you're that far away, you can't see the little pieces. But the color does allow you to see a point of stars here, it already, it already gives you something to, to focus on and then as you get closer you can see different elements. And that's very traditional. I mean, if you go to a madrasa in, in Fez or in Marrakesh, the beautiful Marinid madrasas have these big ceramic geometrical dangos all the way around, but as you come in, those compositions are very far away because you've got a big courtyard and the composition is all the way around the outside, the same distance from where I am now to the back wall there, for example. So those compositions are very far away, but the way that they've used color means that even though I'm far away, I already get to discern certain shapes. And then when I get closer, you can see the shapes much better. You get shapes like, for example, on the back of my laptop. But that's the purpose of color, amongst others, to make, to help guide the eye of the viewer just to break it down into things that are, like I said, visually digestible. And this is something we did last month for um, Dubai Design Week. I, I did the one on the right, yeah. So for me, that's also an interesting opportunity because this is made with an Italian mosaic company called Santini, who do a lot of big things in the Middle East and in Italy as well. And we, th we thought, is there a way that you could combine the Italian mosaic tradition with the Islamic geometric design tradition. And of course, if you go to the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, most of those fantastic compositions on the facades there are in little glass mosaic tesserae little pieces. So it would well, be nice to use glass mosaic tesserae, but then do something like this. And what I've always liked about <coughs> mosaics is that you can do really beautiful color, subtle color gradations. And so that's what we've done. So it goes from blue to sort of purpley color, but then very gradually. Yeah, so for me it's always interesting to work with people who can do things that I can't, and, and vice versa. And together you make something that can only come through collaboration. Yeah, so I write books, as you know. Um, this is the, uh, the Farsi edition, so there's an amusing story about that. So I wrote this book um, in Dutch originally, but of course the Dutch, Holland's a very small country. The Dutch market is Holland and half of Belgium, and the market is quickly saturated. But as it, <clears throat> quite soon after I published it, I went to a conference in Leiden in Holland, and there were a couple of um, Iranian professors of mathematics, and um, they saw my, my new book, and they were looking at it, and they go, oh, this is quite nice, and this could be a popular book in Iran. Um, and they said to me, well, but of course, as you know, in Iran, we don't have copyright laws, so this can happen in two ways. Either you work with us to make it look nice, or you don't, and we do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I said, well, you know, my publisher would kill me, I can't do that. So I thought that was the end of it until two years later I get a big envelope from Tehran with my uh, bootleg uh, edition <laughs> <laughs> in there. Yeah, so anyway, so this book has been, we're doing a 10th anniversary edition. So that's coming out next month. So this used to have a CD. We're getting rid of that for, for obvious reasons and extra pages to compensate for that. And it's coming out in Korean as well. Um, next month. And I also wrote something about Escher. People are familiar with Escher? Famous Dutch graphic artist. Escher is very interesting because as a young man he went to the Alhambra in Spain and he took a notebook with him and he made lots of drawings, lots of copies of the patterns that he saw in the Alhambra. And it's really interesting to see which ones he copied and which ones he didn't. And you can see that what he learned, it's obvious to see what he learned there. So for example, in Islamic geometric design, you also have this principle of having a structure that gives you a context for being creative. And a structure like that makes difficult things less difficult. And that's really what Escher used in his work for, for decades, really. Yeah, this is a book I've been working on even, even today, actually. The e-book on best practice. Um, so, briefly, you can look at 1400 years of design excellence in Islamic geometric design, and it's a miracle, really, that regardless of which part of the world you are, which century, these patterns were always used in a very consistent way, except in the 21st century, and except in Ismaili Jamal Khama, because you do it very well. But you can go to any hotel lobby in the Middle East, and there'll be things there that wouldn't have passed quality control 500 years ago. So that vexes me, <laughs> but also, you know, I think that's something that we should try and remedy. So this is what I've tried to do, to try and identify what are, in this case, the six things that have guaranteed design excellence for 1400 years, and what are the mistakes to avoid as well, uh, using contemporary examples. For which there are plenty. <laughs> yeah, so that's all the now. All right, so enough about that. Um, yes, so I wanted to show you a few um, basic principles, like it says, of Islamic geometric design. Firstly, yes, so if you forget all the slides today, you only remember one, make this the one that you remember. So this is my Islamic geometric design family tree, and it's based on the premise that every pattern starts as a circle. And the first creative choice that you have to make is into how many sections do I divide my circle. So you could choose to divide your circle into four or eight equal sections. That gives you a category for fourfold, which has, for example, shapes like this, this octagon, like you have in your ceiling here, eight pointed star, sixty pointed star. You can see in contemporary design, fourfold patterns are very popular. And I, there's, there's quite a lot of fourfold patterns around this building as well. Alternatively, you can divide your circle into six or twelve equal sections, which yield shapes like six pointed stars, hexagons, etc. And the greatest richness, the greatest variety of patterns, historically, you will find them sixfold. There are hundreds of them. Or you could divide your circle into five or ten equal sections, which gives you a category called fivefold, which has, for example, shapes like this, five pointed stars, pentagon. This category is the old one out. And traditionally, when craftsmen designed this one more category, here, we look for the challenge, and they find everything else. So patterns with seven pointed stars, nine, eleven, thirteen, all these exist, but they're really rare. So for you, in any pattern, in all likelihood, any pattern or composition that you will see will be this, this, or that. It has to be something. And it's a nice skill if you want to get a better understanding of Islamic geometric design, is to always from now on ask yourself. Is this pattern that I'm looking at a four-foot pattern, a five-foot pattern, or a six-foot pattern? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so, to go with that previous slide, every pattern has a 
a visible layer and an invisible layer. The visible layer is what you see. The invisible layer is what goes on in the background, the structure, like we saw in the Escher uh, image. So, for example, fourfold patterns. You can draw a pattern that fits in the square, and then you tessellate that to make a bigger pattern, simply put. Alternatively, for sixfold, you can design something that fits in a hexagon, and then you tessellate that to make a bigger pattern. Simply put. Fivefold, different rules apply because you can't tessellate a pentagon. And you can see I've tried that, but the trace gaps doesn't work. So that's why different rules apply. So how do you know what you're looking at? How do you know whether you're looking at a fourfold, a fivefold, or a sixfold pattern? The answer is, well, if you can count, you can figure it out. So what you count are identical shapes arranged around the central point. And quite often, shapes like that. Petal shapes are called them, but you can call them something else. So here, for example, you can see there's eight of those petals. So therefore, that's a fourfold pattern. So it doesn't get more complicated than that. Counting, I, st I still do it even after 25 years. When I see a pattern, I just count quickly so I know what I'm looking at. And if I know it's a fivefold pattern, then I think, okay, I don't have to worry about four, four, six, four, I know it's this, and it just focuses your mind a little bit. And if you can, once you start identifying different patterns, you also build up a little repertoire in your head of different patterns. And once you've seen one fourfold pattern, and the next time you see a pattern, it's also fourfold but different, then by contrasting and by seeing similarities and differences, you, that's how you're going to read, if you will. Okay. So every, every composition, every pattern has to be something. Everything has to be fourfold, fivefold, or sixfold, or in the unlikely events in the everything else category. So what about this? I could tell you, but I'll ask instead. What, what is this? Five, that's right. So if you count these petals, there's ten of those. So it's a fivefold pattern. You can even count this one, two, two and a half. If this was a complete one, that would also have ten petals, of course. So one of the characteristics of best practice, traditionally, is that everything is always made to measure, which means that you never chop off a composition just because you've run out of space. You scale it so that it fits. So made to measure, the best way to identify that is to see quarter stars on the corners, like that, like that. When you see quarter stars on the corners, that means that it's scaled to fit that shape, that space perfectly. You will always see that. Except in the so, fourfold, right? So you can see here's an octagon. That's a clue. This is a familiar eight-pointed star. These are arranged, eight of them around the central point. There's various clues. But every pattern always has to be something. You know, it has to be what, fourfold, fivefold, or sixfold. So when we look at this, this is a nice composition in uh, India, also fourfold, I hope you agree. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight petals. So this is the visible layer. There has to be an invisible layer as well. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. So there has to be a layer that has a grid structure, something that explains how you would actually practically make this. Yeah? Because you can see that this is made with half stars at the top and at the bottom which means it's been scaled a bit. So that grid structure would be, could be, like this. So if you want to make this whole thing, you don't have to worry about, can I make the whole thing? You just need to worry about, can I make this? And what scale should it be? So if you use a grid, you can just subdivide it. And it just, it means that by doing that, therefore, it will fit perfectly. And you could even, take the surface area, divide it up into a grid of squares, and then make up your mind later which fourfold pattern you're going to use. It doesn't have to be this, it could be something else. Any fourfold pattern will fit in this structure. You could also do it like... Oh, here's another example. Next slide. Yeah. So, here for example, 
You can see this is a more complex composition, but the same principle applies. This is a uh, nice ottoman canopy, and you can see that they've also subdivided that in a, in a grid like this, which means that you can get half stars here, half stars there, a three-quarter star perfectly there. So the grid makes things easier. It helps you make it fit properly. So here we see the same panel again. This is a possible panel from the previous slide in close up. And here, this red square, this is the same as that. Hopefully you can see. And sometimes you can see that patterns can be tools to make a bigger composition, like here, because you, you, know, you tessellate this. Or they consider to be beautiful enough to be on their own on this excellent Quran page. So you can see, for example, this square is that. Or there's a word, what else? These trilobe shapes are here. If you tessellated this, you would get that. And the only difference between that and that is that this is 20 times bigger. Um, but the steps that you would take to draw it are identical. You just need to start with a bigger circle. That's it. And a bigger ruler to draw your, to draw your line. But the step-by-step -step construction method is identical. Yes, yeah, so let me just show you. So I'm doing two workshops tomorrow and the day after. Uh, but I'll show you for the benefit of those of you who are not going to the workshop how you would construct something. So for example, this is a, a Mamluk door. And this is a pattern I always do in workshops, regardless of whether I'm doing a school workshop for 10-year-olds or a, uh, a longer workshop. So this is the same pattern, pattern, uh, pattern as on the door on the previous slide. So if you want to make that door composition, you don't have to worry about can I make the whole door composition. You just have to worry about can I make this so that I can tessellate it. So it starts like this, and then that, and then that, and then you draw all your pencil lines and then you trace the lines that you need to make the composition. And you can see that there's no measurement, it's just drawing lines from one intersection to another. And that's the beauty of doing it like this, that because you're not measuring, because you're not calculating, if you, start, if you want to make a big version, you just draw a big circle. But the steps will always be the same. There we go. And that's it. So, not not a lot of steps to get a good result. And then you can, I think, yeah, then you tessellate it and, uh, and hey, presto. So this is one that we'll be doing here tomorrow, for example. This is the first pattern I always do. And the, the nice thing of, about doing it like that is that you also you make a group composition, of course, because everybody draws the same pattern, everybody colors it in, in the way that they want, but still, when you put it all together, it makes a coherent composition. Oh, hang on, this slide's in the wrong place. Okay, I hope it's... Okay. So this is a... Well, I'll ask you actually, rather than tell you. What is this? This also has to be something. This has to be fourfold, fivefold, or sixfold. It's four, isn't it? So this is the great structure that I've highlighted there. And this also just has a grid of squares, really. But the only difference is that the big stars sit in two by two squares, and the little stars sit in their own square. So even though this is quite a complex composition, using a structure like that allows you to, to scale it. OK. People know where this is? What's that? 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 Yeah. Um, fantastic building, enormous building, but also very interesting because of all the geometrical patterns that are on there. And also quite a lot of the research. You know, the, all these patterns, I would argue, also refer to other things and not just the random choice. But it's especially interesting for us because at the entrance of Sultan Hassan Mosque, there's something interesting there. Yeah, there, here we go. That. So this composition is unique because it shows you the visible and the invisible layer. We don't know why, 
but it does. It's the only example that I know of in art and architecture where you get to see both. So the white lines are there, that's the visible layer. The black lines are there, that's the invisible layer. So as an educational tool for us, it's great, because you can see that they did actually use the grid structure to make, to make compositions. And of course, it's not a, a grid with just one shape. It's a grid with several shapes, but identical shapes have identical ingredients. And you can see that this eight-pointed star goes in the octagon, this goes in there, these things go in there. We don't know why. I mean, it's, it's interesting to hypothesize about why they did this. Now, I like to imagine that maybe when, when they were making Sultan Hassan Mosque, that one of the master craftsmen gave the drawings to an apprentice and said, look, we're under a bit of time pressure, just go knock that thing out. And the craftsman and the apprentice didn't realize what was supposed to be visible and what wasn't supposed to be visible, because it's, it's like I said, it's completely unique. It's also interesting to wonder what the other craftsmen in Cairo would have said when they saw this. You idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it's not supposed to show up, because it's, it's a trade secret. You know, craftsmen use it, but you never see it, except, except here. Okay, so let's have a look at, at sixfold. This is, uh, this is a very unusual pattern, actually, because you don't really have patterns that have that feature curved lines. Then you have curved lines as embellishments, but not curved lines as, as the pattern itself. You had it briefly in the early Umiya period, but that soon fell by the wayside. But this nice pattern is in, um, in the Alhambra, in this case. So, this is also a pattern I, I'll be doing in the workshop tomorrow. But this is uh, Seljuk, but it's the kind of pattern that you can see across the Islamic world. It's a very ubiquitous uh, pattern. This is the visible layer, so there must also be an invisible layer for this pattern, and it's like that. So similarly, if you want to make this whole composition, all you need to worry about is can I make one? Can I make one pattern in a hexagon, and if you can do that, then you can do the whole thing. This is in the, in the Alhambra as well, it's the same composition. And you can see that's the little unit that you need to figure out. Okay. So, this is in Pakistan. It's a fantastic building, the tomb of Bibi Jawindi. Really unusual, really unusual in its embellishment, but also in its silhouette, really. And I want to look at that because there's some interesting details on there. So this is a close-up. Um, there are so many different patterns on there, as you can see. But the one I want to look at is this one. So hopefully you'll agree with me that this is a six-fold pattern. You can see these big hexagons here, little hexagons. And it's interesting, especially because it shows us a detail of well, the, the practical considerations that were made in applying this pattern, because it's one thing to draw something on a piece of paper, it's something else to manufacture something. And of course, all these things that I've shown you were made by real people who had mouths to feed and families to support. So if you were a craftsman who was tasked with embellishing this tomb of Bibi Jawindi, and you wanted to put this pattern on here, and you think, well, how am I going to do that in ceramic tiles? Am I going to make hexagonal tiles? It's a weird shape. It also means you have to chop it in half at the top and the bottom. And what they came up with was, I don't know if you can see the detail, is triangular tiles. Uh, yeah, here we go. So, their solution is really the best solution imaginable. Is They just have one tile shape with identical patterns and they made hundreds of them. And when you put them together, you get this. Couldn't, couldn't be more efficient. And the interesting thing is if, if somebody just gave me one tile and I saw that tile, it would be quite hard to visualize what that would make if it was sitting surrounded by identical tiles. But you know, that's what you get. It's a, yeah, a very efficient way to make it, but you don't have that much wastage and you just need to make the same thing in a big quantity. Okay, so I want to look at this pattern in a bit more detail. 
Because if we were to analyze this pattern, so this is the same as that. And I mentioned earlier that in six-fold design with geometric design, you have the greatest richness of patterns. There are hundreds, hundreds of six-fold patterns. And a partial explanation for that I'll show you now, because if we were to analyze this, you could say, well, this, if you look at the black lines, this pattern consists only of identical hexagons, identically shaped hexagons. And the way that they sit on top of each other determines the shapes that you get. You put a hexagon there, you put a hexagon there. They sit on top of each other in a particular way, and by doing that, that's how you get the shapes. And just with that simple single ingredient, identical hexagons, you can also make that shape, uh, that pattern, or that, or that, or that, and maybe some other ones beyond that. So just by playing around with the extent that these hexagons sit on top of each other, you can you can get lots of different patterns. So quite often a small change will create something quite different. And that's well, that's one of the reasons why you have so many different sexual patterns. And it's interesting, next time you go to the Arakan Museum in Toronto, if you look for example at let's have a look most miniatures like this, whenever they have architectural detail, it'll be sixfold patterns. And of course, your museum in Toronto has a fantastic collection of these miniature paintings, some of the best in the world, actually. So have a look at that, because it's really amazing to realize that quite often these painters of these miniature paintings spend more time doing the architectural background than doing the foreground. And they had, quite often, you can see like 10 different sixfold patterns on, 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 the, on the buildings, it's amazing. This is in uh, Turkey, that's Ottoman, and I want to show you this pattern. Here we go, one more slide please. Uh, so this is the same as that, and we've seen this pattern before. And sometimes you can also see how patterns evolve, because this is a pattern of overlapping six-sided shapes, this is a pattern of overlapping 12-sided shapes. And you can imagine that the craftsman who was using this pattern at some point thought, well, this is getting a bit boring. Let's see if I can make this six-sided shape into a 12-sided shape. It's easy to do. You put all the pencil lines, all the circles are already drawn. You don't need to add anything. You just need to you know, make it into a 12-sided shape. And if you do that, you end up with that. So that's also a small change, but this looks quite different. So this then becomes that this little thing becomes that, etc. So small tweaks can have a big visual impact. Okay, so fivefold, especially interesting. And I've got a, uh, here we go, in your own very own Strathcona Park. This is an skateboard park here in the summer of Vancouver, apparently. <laughs> and there's, when I was in Edmonton, apparently Edmonton also has a Strathcona Park. Apparently, every city in Canada has a Strathcona Park. And I was with somebody from this wave community there. We spent the whole afternoon trying to find this thing in Strathcona Park in Edmonton until we realized that it was actually in Strathcona Park in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very well made. It's very well made. It's a tenfold composition. I really love it. It's, it's, it's really skillful. Okay, so let's have a look at, at fivefold. So, as I mentioned, you can't make a grid with pentagons, it doesn't work. So if you look at this, this lovely jolly screen, which is a tenfold composition, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten petals, or fivefold, what sort of grid, what sort of invisible layer could you imagine there? So it could be something like this. So you can say, okay, I'm going to draw this, and then I can tessellate that to make a bigger composition. But the problem with that is that it doesn't allow you to be creative. It just allows you to make more of the same. Alternatively, you could do like that. So you could have a rectangle like that, or even this one, the same one. But that has the same problem. It just allows you to make more of the same. It doesn't explain how there's been this enormous amount of creative energy to be found in fivefold, and why most interesting compositions are considered to be fivefold. Oh, hang on, go back on, yeah. So the way to be creative is to use a grid like this. 
Okay, and the next slide will show the same thing, but in more detail. So that's the same pattern as on the Jolly screen. And this is a, you know, a zoomed in version. So this is the grid. So it doesn't have one shape. It's not just squares or just hexagons, but there's three different shapes. And identical shapes have identical ingredients. So this goes in there, this goes in there, and then that one goes, goes in there and there and there. And you put it all together and you get that. So the, cre the creativity comes from keeping this the same and changing the ingredients, or keeping the ingredients the same and changing the grid, or a combination thereof. And that will give you enough variables to keep anybody happy for the rest of their life, basically. Now, I won't say there's an infinite number of combinations, because there's not, but there's a lot. So I'll show you three more slides where the grid is the same, but the ingredients I play around with. Okay, so the next one, so you can see, this is the same, but now there's a different five-pointer star in here. Instead of two opposing arrows, I've got two intersecting arrows like that, and then a different ten-pointer star. And you get that. Just go back to the previous one, if you will. See? Yeah, yeah. Third version. Now it's just a pentagon inside a pentagon. A little bow tie shape like that. And that one, you put it together, and you get that. So, three different five-fold patterns. What they share is the same structure. And it's a very good way to work because you don't have to start with a white piece of paper all the time. You know, you can use the structure and try different things. Not everything will work, but at least you can play around. So for my final slide, I'll show you what happened. I'll keep two things the same. So I'm going to keep these two the same, and I'm only going to change one. There we go. And you get that. So go back one, please. See that from that to that. So this looks very different, and also looks very complex. But it's not that different. So we can see, if you go back, please. Let's look at these two pentagons and this bow tie. If we go to the next slide, they're still there. It's just this thing that makes it so different. So even though this, even though this looks really complex, to draw this thing on its own is not difficult. This is just a five-pointed star with a pentagon around it that gives you all the pencil lines. This is easy to draw, but what it creates is really complex. Okay, so here you can see this little design in action on this uh, Quran page. And also here, for example, on this uh, Mandela book binding. Okay, so lastly, the category everything else. This is in mobile, well, this was in mobile, I should say. This was destroyed a couple of years ago, sadly. Um, and um, it has this fantastic composition here. On my next slide, I'll put a close up of that. Here we go. So, if you look at this, you think, well, what is this? You know, what kind of pattern is this? Because it looks unusual. And if you count these stars, you can see that there are seven pointed stars. So, for millennia, mathematicians have tried to figure out whether it's possible to divide a circle into seven equal sections with just a compass and a ruler, to which the answer is no, you can't. You can get close, but it you know, can't be done. So when you see a seven-pointed star, or seven-pointed stars in a composition, you think, well, how, how did that start? Did they just start with a seven-pointed star and work out from that, or, or, or what? So, I would argue that you let the grid do the hard work. So if you wanted to create this, this is the same as that. What you could do instead is you can design a square like this, and instead of tessellating the square like that, you go like this. And then you create this little triangular bit that needs a creative solution. But that's not too difficult. Um, and the seven pointer stars are created as a consequence of what you do with the grid. So the grid does the hard work, and you still get a good result. Yes, this fantastic dome again. Because it's tempting, of course, when you see a dome like this, to wonder, well, 
does also look good on the other side. There is a really ugly drawing you know, where, where things, but of course it's not, you know, it's perfect. And lines, one of the rules of Islamic geometric design is that lines always have to go somewhere. Lines don't just stop, they, they have to be able to follow it infinitely in theory across the composition. So to design something like that is very difficult. And you can see what they did here is that, of course, here you've got more surface area than there. So you don't want to use big stars there because you get too many lines that meet the destination. So you can see that the big stars are here and then as you get towards the top you get nine, seven, and five. And the way that would design it is that it would make a section that looks like this. And that would be repeated eight times or 16 times sometimes around the dome. Still very difficult, but it does mean that um, if you look closely, if you like to do that sort of thing, you can see look closely where where the join is. You know, they would try to hide that, but of course, and here they've, had, they've hidden it very successfully. But nevertheless, um, that's the way you would design it in sections that you can repeat. And uh, almost lastly, here are two illustrations I've made from two metal doors in Cairo, Mamluk doors. And I've chosen these because if you look at this, it looks conventional in a way. And it's only when you start counting that you realize that what you're looking at is actually very unconventional, very difficult as well. So this is an 11 pointed star, and that's a 13 pointed star. To draw them on their own would be difficult enough, let alone draw them in a composition where everything joins up and where every line has a destination. Here, you have a nine-pointed star with an eleven-pointed star. So it's extremely difficult to do. It would be difficult on the computer, let alone doing it by hand. And of course, for me, the interesting question is, why did they even bother? Because for all intents and purposes, this looks very conventional. It's easy to think, well, this is probably a 12-pointed star, or a 10-pointed star, or an animal or 16 or whatever. It's only when you count that you realize that no, actually it's much more difficult than that. So what was their motivation? If you consider that you know, most people would not give that a second look because it looks familiar even though it's, it's not. It's actually very difficult to do. So there's a lot of things that we, <laughs> there's a lot of things that we don't know about, about Patterns. There's not very much historical documentation, and the best evidence is what we can see, really. Uh, but there's a lot, there's a lot to see. And if you are interested in design, you can make design, teaching yourself to at least determine whether you're looking at a fourfold, fivefold, or sixfold pattern, that's your route to learning. You know, you don't need to come to my workshop to develop. You can develop by yourself if you just give yourself that habit of asking yourself, what am I looking at? That's the, uh, the things that I come from this evening, I would say. Um, I think that's my last slide. Oh yeah, here, here we are in, in action. Um, when we were... <clears throat> the challenge with a pattern like this is of course to make sure that the tile puts all the right colors in the right place. <laughs> and he did. So, thank you very much. Um, Hi, Erica. Thank you very much for your time and for the presentation today. I have one question, and that is, you know, it's a wonderful example of Islamic geometry over, over the course of Muslim history and civilization. So what do you think accounts for the ubiquity of Islamic geometry across all of these societies? Where would it have started, and, and how did it spread, and, and what accounts for this? Well, where it started, there's different, different schools of thought on that. My opinion is that it started in the Jordan Valley in a place called Kibrat al Matyar, which is a, which was the Umayyad summer palace, where you really see that um, the visual language of Byzantine slash Roman mosaics was translated from the floor into a big wall composition and geometry. So being in the supporting role like it was in Roman mosaics was now in the in the starring role, pardon the pun. 
I, I think it starts there, but there's also people who you know, attribute it to uh, you know, brick architecture in Iran, for example. Um, what explains the ubiquity? It's hard to say, you know. I mean, people love beauty. You know, uh, Allah is honored by making beautiful things. But there's, uh, there's also beautiful things that are not <laughs> geometric design. So, it's, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a visual language, it's, it's adornment. I, I think it's sometimes hard to imagine how, for, for example, if, if you were to live in, in, in 15th century Cairo and you're walking around Al Azhar Mosque, for example, there are so many patterns on the facades of buildings on the outside that are sometimes things that it's the extent to which regular people were exposed to Islamic geometric patterns could very well be similar in the way that we're exposed to advertising. It's just there all the time, and of course it does a very different thing, but the ubiquity is was there, and many people were much more versed in, in engaging with these compositions than we are now, um, and that they that they were that the ubiquity was also to to give something to encourage people to contemplate or to reflect on what they were seeing and to reflect on what what they were seeing, what it represented. But we we, we know so little. You know, we read the dark. There's no documentation that says, for example, I crossed an Abdul in Samarkand, I'm choosing this pattern for this reason. There's nothing like that. So, it's hard to, you know, there's, there's plenty of opportunity to hypothesize. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Thank you for your presentation tonight. Uh, it resolved numerous minor mysteries that have occupied my attention. Um, I'm a labyrinth maker, and as a Muslim researching labyrinths in Islam, um, I experienced something similar to you, where you have to reverse engineer what you see, and then you end up with more mysteries. Um, to the previous question of ubiquity with the uh, patterns, um, the Roman mosaics have labyrinths and, uh, to a lesser extent, mazes. And at the Alhambra, at uh, uh, the Bulgulia in, um, in India, uh, Pakistan as well, there are uh, labyrinths designed right into the Islamic buildings. Have you come across any labyrinths or, or, or mazes in your travels, in your work? Does it inform what you teach? No, but, so for, the, for example, the, the slide that I showed when I started talking about fivefold compositions, it's a very complex composition from Madrasa in, in, uh, in Pez. Of course, the way that some of these complex compositions have lives and interlace and that you have to follow is quite labyrinthine, you, you could argue. So. May, I don't know, maybe they try to do the same thing where you, there's a logic to it, but it's there for you to discover and it's there for you to, to find it if you follow a particular path. So, for example, the way I certainly lately have come to consider these patterns is that every pattern is designed in a rectangle, in, every, every, in a rectangle, every composition is designed in a rectangle. And lines always go somewhere, and you can imagine a line coming from infinity, making a brief appearance on the composition that you're looking at, and then off again into infinity. Um, and while they're on the composition, quite often the trajectory that they take is very complex, but is that the only it never stops. Or you know? was there sources that were drawn upon, or architectural designer or artists that did a version and then had it extrapolated into uh, building? It, it, it's hard to say. So there are, there are some patterns that you, for example, that, that sixfold pattern that I showed, that Seljuk pattern with the white grid that I overlaid on that. That's a pattern that you would see across the Islamic world. And of course, the question then is, is it, was there some sort of transfer of knowledge that explained why this pattern appears here and then appears there? And I think there, there are two kinds of patterns. There are some patterns that just reveal themselves if you're playing around with your compass and a ruler. 
if, if your trade is to make geometric patterns and you have some downtime and you're playing around with equilateral triangles and squares, the patterns will reveal themselves. And that's one of those patterns, I would argue. You also have patterns that are too idiosyncratic to even conceive that that would happen. And so, for example, there's a, in my big book, I use a pattern or show a composition that you can see in Eastern Turkey and Anatolia uh, in the 13th century, and then 90 years later or 50 years later, you see that same pattern in different material, different scale in Afghanistan. But they well, that, that must be the same pattern. And that, that pattern must have traveled from Turkey to Afghanistan one way or another. But there, there's hardly any documentation. There's, there's a couple, there's, there's for example, a famous book called the Tokapi Scroll, or a famous document called the Tokapi Scroll, which has many geometrical patterns in there. And most of them are actually Mukarno's compositions rather than two-dimensional. But even that book was not something that a craftsman tucked under his arm when he went to the, to the building site. You know, that's something that was documented by somebody, probably a ruler who asked the scientist at his court, said, look, why don't you go see what those guys are up to and document what they're making. So we, 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 don't, we, don't, we, we don't know. I mean, some, there's also an example I didn't show this evening all in Cairo where you can see a detail of a small pattern that you have to tessellate in your imagination to make it complete, which is a pattern you would never see in Cairo, but you would see in Morocco. So patterns did travel. Um, and, we, and we know that craftsmen traveled, that's for sure, uh, either voluntarily or otherwise. So, you know, that explains some of it. And that just leads to a, sort of a second part of that. Is, are there any symbols that you've interpreted as having a specific meaning? Um, so that there would be an icon that is used uh, to represent the, uh, when you use the word language, is there a language that is a, or, or a hidden language is, behind us? Well, this craftsman chose this pattern because it symbolizes this, to which the answer is no, there's nothing, there's nothing like that. You can also interpret the question is, has Islamic geometric design been philosophically and religiously contextualized, to which the answer is yes, of course it has. So, and symbolism has been, you know, Islamic geometric design is placed often in the context of, of symbolism. But for me, the interesting question, and for other people, maybe not so much, but for me, the interesting question is, do we know why Craftsman chose one pattern and not another? It's certainly not the case that certain patterns only appear in religious buildings and other patterns only in secular buildings. No, that's not the case. So, the question of symbolism, it depends who you ask. That's also the truth of it, you know, there's different schools of thought. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, you mentioned earlier that there is a finite amount of patterns that can be made. So my question is, um, who is discovering more patterns that can fit into these templates now? Um, Well, there's a difference between patterns and compositions, for a start. So, to me, a pattern is a unit that you can tessellate to make something bigger. A composition is something that is, a, is, is fully formed inside a rectangle and is a standalone issue. So, there, there's one friend I have, a guy who lives in, in Qatar now, who, who also wrote a nice little book, literally a little book, on, on Islamic geometric design called Dawood Sutton. He's very good. He showed me some of the stuff that he's been working on, and he's really, you know, he's great. Um, there's, I, I think that the, the, the challenge is nowadays is because Islamic geometric design is considered to be a craft that's under threat, the instinctive response quite often is that we need to protect what we have, we need to keep what we have. Well, I would argue that. What has kept this design heritage so excellent for 1400 years is always that the most creative people saw opportunities to innovate and to, do, to make new things. And rather than conservation, what's needed is revitalization, I would say, because a lot of, nowadays a lot of patterns are just copied and pasted. There, there's, there's, there's people who, there's a lot of people these days who pursue Islamic geometric design as an artistic pursuit. Um, and quite often those compositions are compositions that are sort of roundish, because people start in the middle and then 
you know, becomes a, uh, for example, watercolor composition. But it, it's the, the the emphasis is mostly on recreating a pattern and then embellishing it in a particular way, much much like I did as well. And it, it's it's difficult. <laughs> It's, it's difficult to, to create new patterns and still stay connected to this design heritage. Um, and so, for example, a complex pattern is not complex because the shapes are complex, it's complex because familiar shapes are arranged in a complex way. And there are certain parameters that to create a new pattern without making it completely... Um, I'll explain this very well. The, the, the patterns that are sometimes created are more determined by the technical or technological um, possibilities rather than aesthetic considerations, I find. And that, that is partly because um, there's, there's not really a place where you can learn Islamic geometric design. Yeah, there's the Princess School in London, of course, but they're also very much about Recreating the past, if I may, um, and, and, and to me, there's a bit of a misunderstanding. That's also why I'm so pleased also to be teaching in a place like this, because, and I'm not just saying this to be, to be nice, but it's because I really believe this. I, I think your job at Khan are really shining examples of how you can use the traditional heritage in a contemporary way. You know, it's, it's, it's excellent, and there's not enough of that. And it's a shame because it means that the most creative people in the Middle East and around the world don't necessarily see creative opportunities within the field of Islamic geometric design because the focus is so much on copy and paste or replication. Um, so that's, you know, I, I would hope that that will change. Some of us who've been to Alhambra, it, you just brought back memories for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering. So in Islamic geometric design, we see a lot of uh, um, nature, so stars and flowers and leaves. Mm. So my question is, um, does the Fibonacci sequence have any relevance uh, to Islamic design? So we see it everywhere in nature. Yeah. Um, yes, to an extent. So. Of course, the Fibonacci sequence, for example, will determine how, for example, a leaf on a stem of a, of a, of a, of a, or a leaf on a branch will relate to the next leaf up, yeah? the, 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 and, and also how, how uh, seashells and, 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 and uh, snails and all that, how, how that is, it, it, is structured. It's, it's certainly most Islamic geometric patterns do not have that Fibonacci sequence in them. Um, and they also do not have the golden mean in them. You really deliberately need to put it in a composition to, to achieve that. The closest, um, I mean, one aspect of the Fibonacci sequence is also, is also very much related to fractals, of course, where you can zoom in infinitely or zoom out infinitely, and you have a particular category of Islamic geometric design, especially in Iran. And it's also documented in, in this Tokalki scroll book where you um, use a pattern as a structure for a more dense pattern that sits on top of that. And then on top of that sits another more, even more dense pattern ad infinitum. And those, those compositions are especially interesting because what they do for a start is that they give you a, a big structure that you can see from 20 meters away, but they also suggest that what you're looking at is a is, is, a, is like a microcosm or a world, if you will, where you can infinitely zoom in or infinitely zoom out. To me, that comes closest to to the spirit of uh, representing something like the golden mean or the Fibonacci sequence. Thank you, Eric, for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, Thank you, Eric, for that uh, insightful and inspiring presentation. I really appreciate how the smallest parts, how the small parts connect to the greater design, the relationship um, the small parts have. And I think that the, converse, uh, the conversation that runs through the patterning as you explore the pattern, patterning further. 
and I am excited to um, attend your workshop on Saturday because, well really now, a little bit more now because I don't have to know complicated mathematics, so that's great. Um, and there are a few more spots open for the workshop that is happening tomorrow as well as on Saturday. And if you're interested, you can get more information at the registration table with the volunteers there. I would now like to call upon Aslam Balbalia, Community Engagement Coordinator for SFU Center for Comparative Muslim Studies, to present a token of appreciation. Center for Comparative Muslim Studies. It's just an honor to be able to partner with the Ismaili Center in BC and thank the wonderful Ismaili community in BC for the event that they've put on and for inviting Eric to join us. Uh, we're so happy that you'll be facilitating a workshop tomorrow at SFU's downtown campus and the workshop that you'll be doing here on Saturday to spread this knowledge that you have. We, through the Center, have been doing Islamic Geometric Design workshops since February and two of the facilitators who've been hosting those workshops are here tonight. And it's great to be able to draw on this rich tradition that you've presented and preserved in many ways. I'm from South Africa, and years ago, the first you know, encounter that I had with geometric design was through your work. So it's definitely, over the course of 25 years, spread across the world and given us a link to this tradition and allowed us to make it relevant to our lives in today's times. So again, thank you very much, and we look forward to learning so much from you. Thank you, Aslam. This event would not have been possible without the efforts of our dedicated Aga Khan Museum local volunteers on the PC team, as well as the Smiley Center volunteers and our AV team. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. For those of you who are interested in a tour of the Smiley Center or would like to know more about this space, I would ask that you please sign up with one of the volunteers at the registration table. And uh, before we bring this program to conclusion, um, I just want to take this opportunity to do a picture opportunity up. So all of you are perfect where you're seated. Um, just smile. And if we could have... Um, Eric, if you can just come to the center floor and face the camera and smile, everybody, and Mr. Sultan Balu, our photographer, is going to click away. A couple more. Say, hey, KM. <laughs> Eric Brogue. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us here today. That concludes my MC services, and I wish you all a safe journey home.